Joining us now for analysis on the Republican side of the ticket is Jason Meister, an advisory board member for the Trump campaign. So, Jason, seven days until voters go to the polls, cast their ballots for perhaps the final time. I know there's going to be some court cases perhaps after that. But in the days leading up to that event, where is the Republican Party and the Trump campaign really allocating its resources? I know that the Biden campaign is, for example, going to places like Texas and Georgia. Is the Trump campaign and the Republican Party really focusing on those Rust Belt states? Thanks for having me, Alex. Yeah, we're focused on the battlegrounds. Uh, the president's out there. He's doing three to five rallies per day. Um, the, the data coming out of those rallies is incredible. But the RNC and the Trump campaign are very well positioned to both reelect President Trump and elect Republicans up and down the ballot. There's 4,000 uh, boots on the ground, Trump victory boots, in key battleground states today. We have 2.5 million volunteers that have been trained and recruited. Uh, we've made 156 million voter contacts. That, that beats Barack Obama's high watermark from 2012. Uh, we, have ver we have heavily invested in the Get Out the Vote digital campaign. So I think we're really well positioned. And if you look, he's surging with the, the black community. He's surging with the Latino community. And so I think we're going to come bring this victory home uh, in the next couple of days. And looking back to 2018, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell made a very good point last night saying that after the very hostile Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, Republicans actually gained seats in the Senate. I know that the Democrats did take control of the lower chamber, and a big part of that was not having President Trump on the top of the ticket. Having a presidential candidate at the top usually does have a trickle-down effect. So do you suspect that Republicans will once again be competitive in the Senate as well as the House? Yeah, I, I actually do think that they're going to be very competitive in both the Senate and the House. I think that one of the greatest achievements this president has done is putting uh, over three. He put three uh, originalist Supreme Court justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and then last night, uh, uh, Amy Coney Barrett. So I think that Republican, he's got a, not over 95 percent approval in the Republican Party. I think it's going to help both in the Senate and the House. I think that's a good point, too, because it seems like this upcoming race is really going to be about voter turnout. It seems like, for example, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris aren't too uh, willing to give to the middle ground necessarily. We heard them kind of do so when it came to the issues of fossil fuels and fracking, which is a direct plea, it seems like, to the people of Pennsylvania. But when we talk about where the Republicans can be competitive, I know that the White House gets a lot of emphasis. But after that, for example, is there more of an emphasis on Senate races, House races, or do you just go where really it's going to be the most competitive and you have a chance to flip that seat. Yeah, I think you're going to go where you see there's, comp there's you're going to be competitive. But I think that it's really important to keep the Senate. I'd love to see us gain in the House and take the House back. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity for that. Uh, when you look at some of these states and these races, I think there's a real potential for us to take the House back. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at the Senate as well, I mean, Republicans do have a gift in some regard in Alabama. Doug Jones is expected to lose that race, but uh, by no means does that mean that it's going to be a walkthrough there. I mean, he is polling surprisingly better than many people thought. And there are several other competitive races for Republicans all across the country, Democrats as well. But the point being is that the Senate could be up for grabs. And we've already seen what's at stake, for example, if you don't have the Senate. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about the Supreme Court confirmations, for example, if we didn't have that. And any legislation, therefore, is controlled by Democrats in that regard, too. So when voters do go to the polls, whether it's in Pennsylvania, Michigan, whatever it may be on November 3rd, what is the last message that you want them to have in their minds when they cast their votes? Sure. Look, this is the most consequential election of our lifetime. Uh, it's the Trump recovery versus the Biden depression. It's the Trump boom versus the Biden lockdown. There's no greater contrast. You saw it on the debate stage in that last final debate. Uh, President Trump represents this country, the exceptionalism of this country. Biden wants to hide out in his basement in a witness protection program. There's no greater contrast. And I think you're going to see that. And I think Trump's going to have a victory come election day. And Jason, a lot of the things that we're talking about, I remember talking about in 2016. On the Democratic side of the ticket, we have a candidate who is not campaigning heavily in person, who is going to states such as Texas and Georgia. Hillary Clinton was going to states like Georgia and Arizona and kind of leaving out the Rust Belt states where, of course, we know that the 2016 race was won. Do you see the Democratic Party failing to perhaps correct some of the mistakes that it made in 2016 this time around in 2020? I think there's no question that that's going to happen. I think that Hillary Clinton and the Clinton machine was a far more formidable uh, opponent to President Trump than Joe Biden. Joe Biden is sleepy. He's in his basement. He calls a lid at 9 a.m., 8.30 in the morning. 
almost every single day leading up to an election. I think that the Democrats overplayed the COVID card. They thought that coronavirus was going to help them. They actually, it's actually going to hurt them. The lockdowns, the school closures, the unemployment that they're pushing in these Democrat run cities. And then on top of all that, you had anarchy in Democrat run cities, burning American flags, ripping statues of Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant and George Washington to the ground. And I think that that's going to hurt Democrats come election day. I mean, just last night, we saw in the city of Philadelphia, in the crucial swing state of Pennsylvania, which everyone says this race is going to come down to, we once again saw rioting taking place in that state. And I don't think that there's any money in the world that can buy that effective of a campaign ad if you're trying to persuade some people in the state of Pennsylvania, because they are seeing that. They're waking up this morning, seeing those visuals firsthand. That's not something that's being distorted by any political party. They know exactly what's going on in their home state. So I think that could be persuasive for them as well as when they go to the polls on November 3rd. But Jason Meister... It's always a pleasure having you on this program, breaking down where we stand in this race. Thank you. Thanks for having me.